My great-grandfather said, life is on the wire. Everything else is just waiting. My name is Nick Walenda, and I am a seventh generation performer, artist. The latest thing I did was I uh, walked across the Grand Canyon on a tightrope without any safety devices whatsoever. It was 1,500 feet high, actually higher than the Empire State Building. Oh, Lord. There's nothing unique about me. I am a normal guy. I'm a husband and a father of three, and I cut my grass just like everyone else does. That's what it's about to me. People are inspired by what I do. I told my managers, I want you to find a network that's willing to do this without a tether, without a safety. Discovery believed in me. They believed that I could accomplish this dream. Over 20 million people from around the world watch that live. That's phenomenal. Good afternoon and welcome to We Need to Talk About Commissioning. And we certainly do need to talk about commissioning. Um, ever since I knew that I was chairing this session, I've had lots of people from both sides of the spectrum, commissioners and producers, coming to tell me just how much we need to talk about it. And I'm really grateful to the panel today for coming up here to discuss it. I don't think there's ever going to be an ideal commissioning system. But I think what we have realized over the past few years is that there are certain issues and problems that are common to all of them. And what I'd like to get out of today's session is a kind of consensus on what best practice would look like um, from, from both sides of the fence. Well, as everybody knows, it's been a hot topic this summer. There have been numerous people sounding out about the commissioning process and whether it stifles creativity, whether commissioners are dictators, an uncreative crust stifling talent, um, people who, whose arrogance beggars belief. On the other hand, there are many producers who will say they add to the creative process, they have a great collaborative working relationship with their commissioners. Um, and the truth, uh, uh, both, both things um, can be true. In order to give us some statistical backbone to this, rather than it all being anecdotal, um, broadcast GFK and the Edinburgh Festival um, undertook a survey of UK indies. They sent out a questionnaire to the UK's largest 100 indies on the broadcast list, and 76 responded. And these are people with mainly several, several years of producing programmes uh, and experience. But before we start looking at that, um, something we've done to just bring a little colour to the session is that we have verbatim quotes from commissioners and from producers but we've anonymized them. So I thought we'll just start off by what we call commissioning rants, a few commissioning rants. TV audiences are wise to the way formats work. They can spot a derivative idea a mile away, so please don't pitch me a version of another channel's hit show. But when they say that they don't want derivative stuff, you just look at the schedules, it's absolutely packed with the derivative stuff. And there really is this culture of the kind of cool, young, trendy, career development person. They're just, we're interested in this area, but we're also interested in this area. We, we'd like to do something that, that appeals to women, but also that appeals to men, that appeals to all ages. And actually, this sort of tricksy version of telly uh, that's undeliverable, that's impossible to make, I think it's actually in a strange way killing the industry. That is tense and dynamic, um, but is warm and, uh, you know, not too competitive. But we want it a bit competitive because people like a bit of competition, but not too heavily formatted. Oh, oh and by the way, uh, you've got uh, £100 per hour to make this show. But the problem is this. 
If I walked in with the greatest idea ever, they'll probably say no to it because they're scared of it and because it does not have anything that they can recognise. If I walked in with the worst idea ever, they'd say no. If I then said David Mitchell wanted to do it, they would say yes. Is there an increasing, um, increasing instances of people coming in um, with an idea that I quite like and I say, brilliant, can you go away and do some more work on it and think about this and think about that? And they say, yes, you can. Can we have £5,000, please? Um, I think, well, what the fuck is your development unit for? So, um, the identities have been changed to um, protect the innocent. Up on the um, platform with me today, we have Danny Cohen, um, recently appointed as Director of Television at the BBC, formerly um, control of BBC One. He spent most of his career in commissioning, um, so he has worked at Channel 4, um, he has run E4, he has run BBC Three, and he's run BBC One. Um, next to him, Peter Fincham, currently Director of Television and Channels and Online at ITV. Um, Peter spent the majority of his career as an indie, pitching ideas and dealing with commissioners. Then he moved over to run BBC One, and uh, as I say now, he's running ITV. Jay Hunt, Chief Creative Officer of Channel 4. Um, the large part of her career before commissioning was spent in news, and then she did some daytime production. She then moved over to be the Commissioner of Daytime at the BBC. She then ran three channels, um, Channel 5, BBC One, and Channel 4. And that made me realise we actually have three former BBC One controllers, a uh, uh, four, if you got me, um, sitting on the platform. And then Stuart Murphy, who, like Danny, has also spent the majority of his career as a commissioner um, and uh, is currently director of entertainment channels at Sky. Um, he uh, first, I first heard of, um, of Stuart when he was commissioning UK TV Play, UK Play. Um, he then moved over to become controller of BBC Three. Um, he had a, a couple of years outside in the independent sector where he probably realised what it was like pitching ideas. And then uh, he moved to Sky where he ran Sky One. Unfortunately, Ben Frau and Channel Five, who were offered the opportunity to join the panel today, decided not to. Um, and uh, you'll see that it is a big shame because there are some issues that we would have liked to raise with them. But uh, maybe they'll uh, email or send us their responses later. So I'd like to start, given that you know everybody is an individual, everybody has their own working style, um, from finding out from each of the panel members what they consider the role of a commissioner who works for them to be. Um, and I'll go right to left, starting with Danny. Um, I think a really good commissioning entity is a fantastic spotter of good ideas. I think that's one of their uh, key talents. They can see an original and an innovative, uh, a pioneering idea um, and grab it fast. I think a good commissioning editor then is someone who uh, communicates well with the, the producer um, and gets the balance right between uh, creative input and not micromanaging. And, and I think that's the key. I think the best, I think the best commissioning editors are enabling. They do add value. I mean, was, I thought it was quite interesting on the opening slide there, it said creatives versus executives. And, and I, I know a lot of commissioning editors, and I hope other people in the room do, who are very creative people. Many of them have worked in the independent sector previously. So I think that reflects, you know, that there's probably things to do on both sides. But that's what I'd say. I think they, they creatively enable, they add creative value in the right places and at the right times, and they're excellent spotters of ideas. Peter? I agree with Danny. <laughs> OK. I couldn't, have put it, I couldn't have put it better. So, no, he's, he's absolutely right on all fronts. OK, so consensus on my right. <laughs> Jay? I agree with Peter and Danny. Um, uh, I suppose the only thing I'd add to that is I think there's also a role around, I suppose, being a sort of creative translator. I think part of what a great commissioner does is to take a strategy and a vision and a remit for a channel and relay that to the indies and also the other way around. They take great ideas and they bring them back and see how they can fit into the vision for a channel. So I think they have that function and when they're communicating and working really effectively, it can be a great addition to the process. Stuart, so if you've got anything to add. It's like a joke, isn't it? <laughs> um, all of the above. I think also, um, you know, commissioners need to know about press, they need to about, know about marketing. I think when I've worked with brilliant commissioners, they inspire and they get you to imagine in ways that you hadn't previously. I think they're really good at reading rooms and reading people, so that they know when to really push uh, a producer. I guess, they, I guess we all think this, by the way, I'm not trying to say something special, but, um, you know, I think they know how to read great producers, what a producer's strengths and weaknesses are. Um, and when to have their back, totally support them. 
uh, when to push them a bit more. You know, they, they know the industry very well. And can I, your can I add one thing because I didn't say anything? <laughs> well, you're going to have plenty of time. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought of something to say. <laughs> <laughs> what did she say? Can I just ask? Oh, go so on, let him, let him, let him. I just want to add on. one thing. I don't think anybody disagree with it. Yeah. I think one of the roles of commissioners is to go out and sell their own channel. In other words, when I first became a commissioner, I thought, oh, I was a supplier for many, many years, so I was selling, they were buying. And the first thing I realised is that, no, you've got to go out and sell. You've got to say, bring it to us, don't bring it to the other guys. So mm. I just want to add that. Very good point. I'm so glad you made it. Okay. <laughs> so, Stuart, are your commissioners able to make decisions on their own? Um, no, they need to make sure they make a decision with the channel. I think, um, I, I, I'm sure we're gonna, people are going to talk about this tomorrow and the Kevin Spacey's speech. But um, I agree with Kevin Spacey's speech to a certain point that um, fundamentally you want creatives to feel they've got power and creative freedom. But I think commissioners add value in the value chain. I don't think it makes sense for creatives to go off on one and do it without, um, without kind of either guidelines, creative guidelines from a commissioner, or a commissioner who's, whose job it is to spend time worrying about pitfalls that a producer isn't paid to spend time worrying about. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's, a commissioner has to make collaborative decisions with, with the head of the channel. I think also informally, they also need to make sure marketing are on board. So just to build on Peter's point, <laughs> um, uh, I think people not only need to sell the channel externally, but you know, in certain companies you need to say, this is why I really want you to go big in terms of marketing, or this is what this show is going to say about the channel. And um, you know, it's a big group of people internally, isn't it? So with all of you sitting here, do any of you allow your commissioners to make decisions without reference to you, or do they all have to work to you? Jay? Yes, I mean, in some aspects of, I mean, quite the big decisions, they come to me as well for exactly the reason that Stuart says. I think part of what you do as a channel controller is co to collate a lot of people's visions as to what you want to say about that brand. And it's important that you have that overview. But, I mean, an awful, awful lot of our new talent strands, for example, are, are delegated to my heads of department. I was reading in broadcast yesterday that Phil Clark's commissioned a series of comedy blaps, and I was uh, interested to read about them because I didn't know about them either. And I think, you know, there are certain areas of the schedule that people do commission from a head of department area without referral to me. And Peter and Danny? Um, I, yeah, I think there's a lot of push and pull in commissioning. And certainly uh, at ITV, it's, it's probably more collegiate than, than it might appear from outside. You, you know, at the point at which a lot of ideas are, are, are kind of green lit, there may well be shades of opinion. And so there may be one where you, you know, the commissioning editor or the director of the genre has a particular passion for it. Um, I might be on the same page or a slightly different page. Sometimes, you, you, you know, it'll be this individual who says, but I, uh, you know, want to go with this. And sometimes that passion lies with the, with the talent, the writer, because you think there's a fantastic writer, we'll back them. We're a bit nervous about it, to be absolutely honest. Um, or, you, you know, the, 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 the company. So it's, it, it's, it's a more supple process than it might appear from outside, where it may feel very black and white, and I don't think it is. It's, Lots of shades of grey. Danny, anything to add? Well, I, I, a bit similar to Peter. I, I think I often had experience, I'm not doing commissioning now, but often say at BBC One, uh, say Ben liked a script more than me and was very passionate about it, and I would say, you should do it then, and sometimes I'd be keener on something than him, and I'd say, please, can we do it? And he'd accept we were doing it, and often he'd be right and I'd be wrong, etc. So, and, and I think that's healthy, because you want to... The key is you don't believe you've got all the answers. And, and actually, it's one of the reasons why I think it's quite good that channel controllers change with relative regularity. Because, you know, in my case, Charlotte will now hopefully say yes to some things I said no to that I was wrong about. And um, I think that's quite a healthy process. So, so I, think it, I think channel controller change can help that. And I think making sure you have a relationship where if someone wants to do a script, say, and I, I'm not, I don't get it, then they, they get on with it. I thought something where I don't agree with Danny then. Um, uh, I don't think commissioners should change too often, or channel controllers <laughs> can change too often. And I think I would generally back stability over rather longer periods than the, I would say this because I've been at ITV for five years, but, of the, but the rather longer periods than tends to be the case. And I think there's a bit too much of a kind of revolving wheel um, at, at kind of all levels, and that that is not necessarily ideal for, for okay, suppliers and stability. 
going to move on to the next bit of our VT and then we're going to um, have the first um, bit of our survey. incredibly enthusiastically. I think the worst thing commissioners do is not respond to emails. It's incredibly rude and it's very difficult when you don't get responses from commissioners and then you read in the press that they're asking where all the big ideas are. Um, well, probably a lot of them are in your inbox. Don't assume I remember you. If you're lucky, you probably meet about 10 commissioners in your life. Do you know how many producers I have to meet a month? Don't assume I'm going to remember your name and the idea you pitched me last August when you were working at Totally Different Indie and you didn't have that trendy Shoreditch beard all over your smug face. <laughs> They're expect constantly expecting you to come up with big, ambitious ideas. What we're, what we're lacking is big, <laughs> ambitious ideas. And then you go to them with big, ambitious ideas and you're like, oh, okay, well, not that big or ambitious, that's too expensive. If you pitch me a show and I express some interest, don't go showing it to another channel at the same time. That's just rude. So often the first stage of the pitching process is via email, and um, we asked in our survey how quickly broadcasters responded to emails. Should be coming up in a second. Um, and actually the result was pretty impressive. So 33% of emails are answered within a week, and the vast majority are answered within a month. But then we moved on to talk about the quality of those email responses. And we basically asked, and you'll see this is a constant thing through the survey, we asked um, the respondents in the survey to mark the viewers out of, uh, the uh, broadcasters out of 10. Um, so as you can see, the green are where broadcasters were marked between 8 and 10 out of 10. And the red bits at the bottom are where they were marked between 1 to 3 out of 10. So sometimes there's quite a lot of inconsistency where you can see a, a, a percentage of producers think that the broadcasters are great and another percentage think actually they're not so good. Um, now Stuart Sky um, seems to be a bit of a victim of this, this inconsistency with 24% rating you highly but 17% almost you know one in five not rating you highly. How, how would you account for that? Well, I was disappointed when I saw this. I mean, I think my general view on the um, whole survey was I thought we were better than this survey suggested. Um, so a kind of top line thing is we're going to get miles better. Um, and I'm annoyed we're not the best, um, uh, to be totally honest. Um, uh, I think on this particular one, I mean, what I would say is this survey gives loads of stats, and one of the key things I need to do is just unpack them a bit. So a response from indies that we work with, I suspect, will be different from responses from indies we don't. Um, so after this, one of the things I want to do is see whether we take this a step further at Sky and do anonymous surveys with indies we work with and then anonymous ones with people we don't. You I mean think people we're... whose ideas you've rejected? Is yeah, that what? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because I, th I think there's probably a form of good rejection. I've certainly, um, you know, when I was an indie, uh, and we used to talk about when I think we've all worked together, um, the second best thing you can hear is a, is a quick no with, a, sort of a, with an explanation. Um, so uh, I think we are probably generally, as a broadcaster, experiencing teething issues. We're not a big team, but we're investing 600 million by the end of next year. Um, uh, for me, that's not good enough, so, and I need to make it better. And do you think, um, Danny, there's a sense in which emails, I know you, you've got it as you know, part of your mission to speed up responses, but are emails part of the problem? Um, first thing I'd say is whoever, that, I really hope that commissioner, I know it's funny, whoever that commissioner is who's calling people, I really hope they're not working at the BBC. <laughs> Because if they, the, the one who was, you know, really quite right, I just wouldn't You'll be able to work. spot them by their voice, and they're yeah. only really about that big. Seriously. <laughs> and you say it's anonymous, they're yeah. pretty obvious. They're very small. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't think that, I, personally, I, I, you know, I, I don't think that is right, and I wouldn't want them working for me. Um, I think email is a problem. I think we're all drowning in email. But um, 
that's the world. We're, you know, every industry in the world has got that challenge. I mean, my overall sense, and you get it from this one, we're out, is that the BBC um, is doing okay. I think you get a sense of that we're going in the right direction, uh, but we've still got work to do. I mean, I, that's the overall sense it gives me, true of that slide and others, that I, I think we've got an excellent commissioning team. I'm genuinely very proud of them. I'm proud of their ability, and I think they add a lot of value, but we've clearly got room to improve. Um, so that's why I put together the thing. We've been working on it for a, since I took over, really, about putting together a new set of commitments that we're going to make to the independent sector about how quickly we respond, the quality of our feedback, uh, what we do when meetings are cancelled, particularly what we do when meetings are cancelled with companies outside well, we'll of London. To, yeah, we'll come so on to so we, we've got a whole range of things to do. And just, just one thing on it. The point is, it's not only just the right thing to do, because it's the respectful thing to do. The point is, it's, I want us to have the best ideas. It, you know, Peter was just referring to that. You know, if we are going to be the best broadcaster in the world, we've got to have the best ideas, and that means we've got to be the best people at, uh, you know, working with indies and getting their best ideas. So that, there, there's a kind of... There's a self-fulfilling reason to do it as well as it being the right thing to do. Peter, I know you've been working hard at ITV and sort of taking it as a matter of pride now to try and be the best um, at commissioning. Um, and you must be quite pleased with this because you've got the least number of dissatisfied and the most number of satisfied. But I'm just wondering, is there something that you've asked your commissioners to do specifically that has resulted in this? Um, I, I don't know if there's anything very specific. And uh, I, I know Danny's kind of working on this code of practice. So when I read that, I thought, well, maybe we should work on a code of practice. But I, I don't know that I feel that you need to formalise it. I can remember this is donkey's years ago when I used to supply programmes to Channel 4, and commission editors would say, we're not allowed to keep you waiting for more than 14 minutes. In other words, it was, it was in a code of practice. And we'd sort of have a bit of a giggle about it, to be perfectly honest. It didn't seem to me to be the essence of it. It wasn't some rule saying you can't keep waiting more than 14 minutes. It's all to do with the relationship and the behaviour and so on. I mean, we have, you know, we have quite a lean commissioning team. I think we have the you know, smallest number of commissioners to, to our output. And I think, I hope that generally, we encourage good behavior, courteous behavior. Danny's absolutely right. It's out of self-interest. It's not out of altruism, because we want people to bring us the best idea. I, I've increasingly thought, the longer I've been a, a channel controller, that the key competitive point for a broadcaster is do they bring you the idea first? Because if you know your job and you've got reasonably good judgment, you should spot it and therefore you should commission it. But if they didn't bring it to you first, you'll never see it. So of course we want to be dealing with our suppliers in a way that encourages them to do that. I, I might say, just looking at this particular slide, I'm surprised if we think or anybody thinks that 33% of emails replied to in a week is a good statistic. I don't think it is a very good statistic. Depending on what you mean by supply, you might mean a kind of acknowledgement supply, saying I'll get back to you in detail. But Christ, if I sent an email to somebody and they hadn't replied a week later, I'd feel, I'd feel pissed off. You, you know, it's a sort of a basic courtesy. So I'm, I think I'm probably more about general behavior, um, you, you know, sounds tedious, being nice to people, courteous to people, and so on, than about codifying it. But I suspect we're all talking the same language. So talking about being polite and courteous, we're going to move on to look at the time taken to secure a meeting. Um, now here, 54% of producers said that the average time taken to secure a meeting was one to two weeks. Um, and as you can see, um, Channel 5 and Sky um, have about 21%, 22% that take a month or more. But if we turn over to the next bit, um, this isn't as good as it seems, because a lot of those meetings are cancelled at very short notice. In fact, 58% of the producers say that they've had a meeting unreasonably rescheduled at short notice. And it's really obvious from this slide that the two biggest offenders are the BBC and Channel 4. I, I did wonder whether it was because so many BBC commissioners have gone over to Channel 4 recently, they've taken their bad habits with them. But um, <laughs> there, there may be... Uh, another explanation. So, Jay, you must be disappointed with this. Well, I think there are a couple of things. If you look at the earlier slide, um, the number of people who answered this survey, which you just remember is 76 companies, uh, um, 
work, the vast majority have worked with the BBC and with Channel 4, so we're doing more traffic with these people than other people sitting on the platform. I mean, I think at the end of the day, the slide before is very good for us because what it's basically saying is that we've got to a point now where something that was critical when I arrived, there was a huge number of complaints, people couldn't get in the building, there was a closed shop, there were cosy relationships, that's not happening, and we've got a great track record at getting meetings in. This is a very disappointing slide, I completely agree, but I think, again, in terms of context, when we did a rough toss-up, we think last year we got 15,000 ideas submitted by email, which is an astonishing number. And last year alone, we worked with 460 companies, which is a very, very, very large number of people and far more than any of the other broadcasters. So I think in that context, you know, we need to get people in the door. This isn't acceptable. We shouldn't be cancelling at short notice. And it's something that the team are very, very clear about. I agree with Peter. I think this comes down to basic manners. And I've been very clear from the moment I walked through the door. It is about courtesy and about treating people with respect. And if we're getting that wrong, then one of the great advantages about having set up Stuart as the indie advocate, or you can come to me direct, is that we want to hear about that, because I think these are pockets of behavior that we don't want to see happening. Because to me, it is a basic lack of respect. Um, I've experienced it myself. I've worked, well, now run an out of London indie, and it can be a disaster. You've actually paid train fares, or you've paid plane fares if you're coming over from Belfast or sometimes down um, from Scotland, and the broadcaster doesn't refund those when they cancel the meeting. So, I mean, Danny, you've said you're going to try and do something about it, so let, let's hope. Well, I, I mean, I'm just being too, I, I, we're not good enough on that. I, I don't think you can excuse or defend it. We're not, we're not good enough on that. I, I, I think the one, um, and we need to get better, I, I, I think the, the out of London one is particularly pertinent because of the money and the time. So what I've said to the teams is you have to give out of London Indies 48 hours notice of cancellation of the meeting by telephone and email, and it should only be cancelled if there's illness. Um, and any, any meetings that are cancelled are prioritised in the diary to be rearranged. And, and I think just having some basic principles that, that are based on courtesy, respect, and actually, as you know, Peter and I have been saying, our own interests. You know, that idea coming down the train might be the one we're looking for. Uh, you know, it's, mu it's mutually fulfilling to get this right. So moving on now, if you do actually get a meeting, to look at how does the commissioner treat you in the meeting? Um, and again, it's the same sort of ranking system. Um, I mean, I think um, the interesting thing here, well, one of the interesting things is, you know, you look at Sky, um, and you seem to have most consistency. So 57% giving you 8 to 10 out of 10, and only 4% giving you one to three. Some of the other broadcasters, you know, Channel 4, Channel 5, have got a larger number, while well, they've got a lot of people giving them high marks at Channel 4, they've also got almost one in five saying that the commissioners don't behave well enough. Um, so I don't know, Stuart, what you might think might be behind the consistency, whether you've asked people to behave in a certain way. I mean, I think um, to, uh, we don't do meetings for meetings' sake, and uh, we don't do as many meetings as everyone else on this panel because um, I think we're smaller, you know, we do less commissions. So it's probably harder to get a meeting with us. Um, I think, but when you have a meeting, I hope it's brilliant. I hope you leave inspired and uh, tested and it's a really enjoyable one. I think um, when, uh, probably about last year, when we got the full commissioning team, we started to have uh, big team meetings about what a great commissioner should be or should do. And I don't see it that a commissioner is in the ladder ranking of being one step more important than an exec producer. And then ultimately it ends with me as having the definitive voice on yes or no. I think, funny enough, you know, 10, 15 years ago when I worked at the BBC, it felt a bit more like that. But actually, that's probably an uh, unfairness to the BBC. I don't think it's like that, actually. I, I suspect we're all a bit like this on the panel, that we see the role of commissioner as materially different than the role of, a, of an exec producer. Um, what I don't need a commissioner to be, as I said in my uh, seminal controller session, um, <laughs> which will be available on YouTube if anyone's um, interested. That, um, no, what I, tried to, what I tried to say was, I think uh, a commissioner isn't a de facto exec producer. And I've worked, with ex I've worked with commissioners who feel like they are the headmaster or headmistress, um, who uh, are a super exec producer, who have even more wisdom than the exec producer. I just think that's bollocks. I think um, the commissioner has a different role, that has a more coordinating role, a more kind of helicopter view of where the channel's going, a clearer sense of audience research, and they worry about that, they're paid to worry about it. 
They're paid to be a hand on the tiller. They're not paid to uh, go through the detail of a half hour show. And certainly when I was an Indian, we pitched to uh, some channels, some commissioners, you'd, uh, when you got in a relationship with them. Um, it was uh, both a plus and a minus that you knew the commissioning editor was effectively gonna AP and edit that show. And it was a plus in that you thought, oh great, they can do it. And um, they'll know exactly what they want, they can just get stuck in. Uh, it was a minus in that you were completely um, uh, editorially impotent. And, um, and you sort of had no contribution, it was not a fulfilling experience. So, so we have meetings at Sky where we all get together and say, this is what we do, this is how to be a good commissioner. Um, you get trained in production, you don't really get trained in commissioning. And you're in charge of quite a big budget and a lot of power and, um, and no one kind of says, this is how to do it well and, and this is how one does it badly. And it, it winds me up, so we do that at Sky. So I don't know if that's why. Well, uh, you've teed up the next section perfectly. So really? we want to discuss this in more detail. What exactly should a commissioner's role in the production process be? But we'll start with um, some of the VTs of the people that Stuart recognises. <laughs> I think it's really annoying that commissioners, uh, their job is actually commissioning, but uh, unfortunately now that seems to have changed to show running. Uh, and I kind of think if you want to be a showrunner, then you be a showrunner in production. And if you want to commission things, then you commission things. What you aren't is Stephen fucking Moffat from Doctor Who running the show. Creatives come in and basically expect you to do all the work. So they kind of come in with some, they basically come in with thinnest shit. If a commissioner can't add value to a programme, that's a crap commissioner. What I don't want a commissioner to be is a showrunner where you, where you get them pulled into a meeting, get ridiculous notes, bearing in mind they have had nothing to do with getting the talent on board, organising shoot dates, sorting out the studio. So it's really easy to suddenly walk in at the end of the day and go, I don't like that, it's a bit too pink for me. I would say program make makers need to be making better shows then. I end up, but it, it, it depends because there's so many shows that are, are kind of abominable and absolutely need the input that commissioners make. I think the worst thing a commissioner can do, to be honest, is stab you in the back halfway through the process or after you've made something. Be on board with you for the majority of the process and then afterwards, when you've delivered it and it doesn't quite pay off, suddenly say all of the things that they always thought was wrong with it anyway, uh, but didn't bother sharing with you during the part of the process where it could have made a difference. So we asked in the survey what the producers felt about the quality of the commissioner's involvement in the commissioned ideas. And we got some vastly different responses. So as you can see, the BBC um, and ITV quite comparable um, in their, their scores. Um, Channel 4 and Sky quite polarized. Um, five is the worst, but as I say, they're not up here to answer for themselves. Um, so. Jay, it's quite interesting that you've got almost the same percentage saying that commissioner's involvement is great and is not so good. And I'm wondering here, is this to do with, obviously, the, you know, there are lots of people commissioning, so some are better than others, or? Yeah, I think inevitably there's a degree of subjectivity in here, and, you know, I would like to be able to say that 100% of interactions with Channel 4 are perfect, and every piece of feedback is bang on message, and that's all... Fantastic. I'm sure there are occasions when that isn't the case, and I'm, I'm sure I take from this that there are some conversations which are not proving to be as productive as they might be. I mean, I think the other thing I would take from this is we're, part of what we're out there to do is to take huge risks, to make some really difficult shows. And I think if you look at some of the shows that have been in production for years, whether it's Plane Crash or Drugs Live or The Mill, which was in production for two and a half years, they're trying to do something difficult, and I think you're going to get in situations where the feedback can be quite tense and there can be exchange of views and it, we're trying to, to push the boundary. So I'm not hugely surprised there's some pushback, but clearly I would far rather seeing that entirely green. And I mean, it gives me pause for thought to think, well, are there some particular individual pockets of what we're doing that we're getting wrong? And obviously, you know, everybody knows you're very hands-on. You've always been. Um, and as you say, it's your name above the door, just like Peggy Mitchell and the Queen Vic. Do you sometimes think that your commissioners are trying to second guess you or that sometimes they're not on the same page as you so they give one message to producers and then you know you might see a show and give another message. 
No, I think it's a bit of a myth, to be completely honest. I mean, the extraordinary thing about my job is, is, frankly, the scale of it. I mean, I'm sitting in the creative direction for Channel 4, More 4, E4, the scheduling direction for 4, 7, and for Film 4. And it is, it is in, utterly inconceivable, however much I might want to, to, to be across absolutely everything. So I, one of the reasons of the changes that have happened over the past couple of years in the commissioning team is I need a team that I can delegate to, who can take responsibility for delivering the sorts of quality that I am held to account for. I mean, I am held to account by David, by the board and ultimately by Ofcom, by the quality of what we put on air. You know, you'd be surprised if I wasn't across some of it, but I couldn't possibly be across all of it. Do we all think we delegate enough? I, I wonder. I mean, certainly whenever I get feedback or whenever I give feedback to commissioners, um, a constant thing is we need to delegate more and more and find the sweet spot where you delegate enough, but you don't do a, a Kevin Spacey where you say, here, have everything. Yeah. I just wonder what everyone would have done. Do you think you delegate? Uh, I, I like delegating, because I find having too much to do not very pleasant. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I, I want to have a balanced life and not be working every evening and six or seven days a week. So I'm very pro-delegation. I, I mean, for example, when I go on holiday, I, I put my BlackBerry in my mobile and say, if it doesn't come out for two weeks. And, and I, my view on it is, if you can't trust someone else to run things for a couple of weeks, you've not hired the right people. You're not working with the right people if you can't leave other people to get on with it. So, so I, I'm quite a strong believer in delegation. I'm sure there have be, been examples in my past where I could have done it better, but certainly it's something I, I try and work quite hard on for the sake of both, actually, it's good for your business, it's good for your personal life and your life balance. But, Peter, if you've got a new series coming on the air, how many times would you have seen it? Would you have seen a rough cut or would you have just seen a fine cut? Would you have seen the first episode and the second episode? I mean, where do you tend to... Well, I, it will vary enormously. It will vary from genre to genre, um, and you know the, the sort of size of the project or, 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 or whatever. I mean, very often, you know, things have gone out that I haven't seen at all all the time, um, and, and that's absolutely right. But if it's a big drama series, um, I, I, I will you know be shown it. There's always I always find there's a great reluctance to show it until it's entirely kind of dubbed and finished and everything, and I'm trying to get hold of it. And often, the first time I ever see something from um, you know, big new drama series is, the, is when I'm, we're putting together like a marketing tape for Edinburgh. And I suddenly say, oh my god, that's that series. Nobody's shown me anything yet, and I would like to have seen it. So I try to drag it out of the marketing department at that point. But I mean, to the, this broader part, Stuart's point about delegation, I, I think quite clearly, I've never, I said this in my, session this morning, my controller session this morning. I've never liked the word control in controller. I think it implies all the wrong things. It should be kind of enabler uh, or, or, or whatever. I think ITV has always had a kind of strong tradition of delegated and powerful genre directors. I think of a, an example, uh, Nick Elliott, who was the head of drama for years, and I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but when there was a change of director of television, and one went out, another one came in, by all accounts, he would put a commissioning form in front of the um, uh, director of television and it said, new drama series about a detective, please sign. <laughs> in other words, he wanted to keep the director of television out because he was an all-powerful head of drama. Now, I don't know whether that's particularly healthy. It's certainly not the way I've worked with um, Laura Mackey and now with Steve November. But I think it's obvious that if whoever's doing these jobs that we're doing become sort of, you, you know, over, uh, either over detailed or try to control everything and edit everything, it's not healthy, it's not a good thing. And Jay, what about you? How many do you see every episode well, well, of a new I mean, series? I, think, I mean, I, I, I'm all nodding sagely because I think it's absolutely true. I mean, frequently when you see the Edinburgh tape, I think, gosh, that looks great, and it's the first, first time I've seen it. I mean, part of the reason you need to see things, I think, and I don't see anything in exactly the same way. I see the big shows, the big plays that we're making, the multi-million pound investments you'd expect me to see. Um, but also, I see it for the reason that Stuart referred to earlier. Sometimes we're assessing it, actually, we're not looking at it for quality or to send notes. We're thinking, well, have we got the scheduling right on that? I wonder whether the marketing's right. I wonder whether we're over-egging it. Is it playing at the right time of year? So I think you're bringing a different set of skills to bear. But it's, you know, in most instances, stuff arrives as a fine cut. And I have exactly the same experience Peter does. I've got a very proud team of commissioners who keep things very close. And they want you to see them at the last possible moment so that you can do as little as you possibly could to it. And it goes on the air. And I think that's absolutely as it should be. Can but I mention, um, can I mention something? Right? I just wanted to oh, yeah, just on. pick. So, so if you see a programme and it's not what you were expecting it to be, 
Do you feel it's the commissioner's fault or do you feel it's the producer's fault? I don't think it's anybody's fault. I always think uh, in my mind that most programmes start over here with huge expectations. This is going to be the big one. We're all really excited about it. I can't think of a show which somewhere in the middle didn't do this. <laughs> you know, the casting went wrong, the script wasn't quite right, it didn't work on location, the idea was a bit thing. And the ambition then is to get it back up to being quite close to what you set out to achieve. I, I don't think you apportion blame in quite that way. People go into these things with exactly the right ambition. They want to make great shows. And from the channel's point of view, everyone wants exactly the same thing. You want a great show. The producer wants to make a great show. In its b best version, it's a fantastic creative collaboration to deliver that for the audience. And I think you know, that still happens more times than it fails. Sorry, well, Stuart. Uh, no, it was just when, when I was in India, I think one of the, one of the things I uh, found difficult was how you deal with a crap commissioner. And, um, and someone mentioned to it, uh, it to me uh, last night and said, um, you know, when you're an indie, if you're dealing with a commissioner who's not particularly good, it's really hard to raise that with a channel head. It is. Because, you know, if you raise it with a channel head and they totally, you know, they hired the commissioner and they're trusting them with a whole lot of things, actually, they, the channel head might think you're a, you're a fool. Um, you obviously can't raise it with the commissioner and give them feedback because you'd be straight out the door. So, um, and... You know, I think channel heads need to find a way of working out how we get great feedback on all of us, including our commissioning team, while making sure, you know, we're all proud of our commissioning teams. I'm sure we'd all say we've got the best in the business and three people here would be wrong. Uh, but, um, and not me, is what I mean, just to be clear. Um, uh, but, um, you know, we need to make sure that we get proper feedback because there is a, such a thing as appalling commissioning. So I'm just going to move on to the next slide. And I think you're absolutely right, Stuart. And Am I, think... I teeing you up for the next thing again, Lorraine? No, just, just, to, just, to, just to keep us moving through so I cover everything. Um, but, you know, it is really difficult as an indie to complain because you might have to deal with the commissioner again. Um, and, you know, they are in a relationship of power. They are in a position of power uh, over you. And I think, you know, one of the things that the BBC often says is that they want fewer, bigger, better programmes. Sometimes I wonder if you need fewer, bigger, better jobs so that you have fewer people who are empowered, who don't have their diary full of, you know, BBC meetings, the BBC does love a meeting, um, you know, which can also impact on their ability to do their job, particularly if they are in the front line as commissioners are. So do you sometimes think there are too many people in the chain? Um, I don't know whether I think it's the amount of pro hoops you have to go through. So I think a two-tick system is fair and reasonable. I don't know whether it's necessarily about the amount of people there. I mean, one thing we a challenge for us at the BBC is the volume of ideas that come in. And one of the things I sometimes think is actually we just don't have enough people who've got enough hours in the day, partly because we, I think you're right, and we're trying to get better at the amount of internal meetings, to get through everything, to make sure the replies are prompt, uh, to make sure you're seeing everyone. So I, I don't know whether it's about more or less. And I, I think there's a, if you don't mind me saying, there's a bit of a kind of narrative around, you know, BBC, the amount of people working there. We are dealing with a lot of ideas and people are working very hard. I think the thing on the last slide saying that only 7% of people thought that the feedback from BBC commissioning teams in production was not good is one of the reasons I think we've got a good team. And I think that shows those people are doing a good job albeit, you know, I've said very clearly, there's lots of things we, we need to get better at. I mean, sometimes there's an issue where you do have a very, very seasoned producer who could have been making excellent programmes for 20 years, and they have to deal with a very, very junior commissioning editor who may not be as qualified as they are to yeah. make editorial decisions. Yeah. And that's but, quite... You know, but you know what? I, I think I'd say is mutual respect is what this is all about. So, you know, when you were a channel controller, you may have felt you had strong opinions on, on genres you had less experience than the producer on, but I doubt very much you held back the rain. <laughs> so, so, um, so the key for me is mutual respect, and, and that's how you get the best. And it might be that that young producer possibly has got a perspective or an insight that the more senior producer hasn't got. And if you're prepared to listen to each other, then, then you're going to be in a good place. I think that's fine. Where, but it's a problem when that young commissioner says their opinion as if it's a definitive. Agree. And, I agree. You know, That's I'm, part of mutual respect. Yeah, totally. But I'm, I'm sure we've all had that thing where uh, I certainly had it as an indie. You'd pitch to, um, uh, I'd pitch to a comedy commissioner, and the response was, it's not funny. That's such a sort of, there's no definitive kind of, if you, know, if you bring a different perspective, bring it as a different perspective and not the definitive. And I think what this slide shows is that indies welcome feedback from commissioners. They want it. 
You know, when they, we ask them, what are the three things that commissioners do, i.e. that they actually do do, that improve the production process, constructive feedback and creative input were two of the top three things. But on the other hand, when we ask them, what do they do to undermine the production process, constant interference was the, the biggest thing that they do to undermine it. So it's like, when does constructive feedback and creative input stop being that and become a negative? And Stuart's the only person who said he doesn't expect his commissioners to executive produce. And how we get that balance between input... Well, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think any of us have said we expect our commissioners to executive produce. I think, we're, well, certainly I'm saying, I think that it is reasonable for a broadcaster to have some ambition around quality control. I think that you can't relinquish that entirely. I, don't, I certainly don't expect my commissioning editors to executive produce. So how, how many times should they see a programme? I think it entirely depends. I mean, I think what's fascinating about this and why it becomes such an interesting debate is that both of those things are the flip side of the same mm. coin, aren't mm. they? I mean, you know, there'll be people in this room who are very receptive to feedback in their life, quite apart from as a programme maker. There are people who are less so. There are people who will regard feedback as interference or people who say the more feedback, the better. And I think, to a certain extent, this needs to be bespoke solutions depending on the nature of the show, the complexity of the show, the experience of the person. I'm just going back to the point earlier. Just on, in defence of the commissioner, it might well be there's a very, you know, a producer who's got a huge reputation over many years and a very junior commissioner. It's just possible, I raise the, the thought, that the very good producer has made an awful show and that the junior commissioner is right. It's not always the other way around. So somehow, you know, it's a fine line, I think, that, that people have to tread, and it is a difficult line. But if we could say what would best practice look like in terms of the creative input from a commissioner. Peter, what do you think that is? Um, God, I don't, I, honestly, I don't know exactly how you, you define it, the kind of the, the proofs in the pudding. And I, and I think that, you, you know, we've, at ITV, we've been thinking about this for quite a while. We did our own survey earlier in the year, um, which we kind of used at the producers forum that we, we do, and and it was it was good, and it was good for us, and, and that's why I'm glad that there's this survey because you, you kind of automatically think if you, you know, if you commission somebody to do something, they tell you you're doing well, and they're, they're, they're telling you you want to want to hear. But our survey was done by YouGov, so it's a very very respectable organisation, and I think I suspect what's good as coming out of this is that we get the issue into the open. I reckon we're all now going to find ways of monitoring this. We're all obviously going to say, you're absolutely right, it's very hard for a supplier to complain about the people they're supplying to. Nobody wants to, you know, alienate a relationship. When I was uh, running talk back in the mid-late 90s, I remember um, having a conversation on the phone with a commissioner at a, at a broadcaster, um, uh, and, and the, the commissioner slammed the phone down on me. Um, I can remember that to this day. It made such an impact, it wasn't the rain. <laughs> I can, it made such an impact on me. I was sort of shaking and I thought, Christ, I'll never work for these people again. With, in hindsight, it was that commissioner's bad behavior. They were the person at fault. They shouldn't have done that. I hadn't done anything that deserved that at all. Um, what had you done, Peter? Uh, I, I, I know I tell you exactly what I'd done. I committed the sin after um, waiting for weeks on end of talking to another broadcaster about the same idea. I don't think that's a sin at all. I think it's absolutely right that we respect the businesses that we supply to us. It's in our interest for the independent supply um, market, whatever you call it, to be successful, because then, then we'll get offered successful ideas. And I never have a problem with somebody coming in and saying, here's an idea, but uh, by the way, I'm also talking to somebody else about it. I don't regard that as a discourtesy. You're running a business, you can do, run it any way you like. And I don't mind looking at an idea that somebody else is looking at, but that, that you do get that, and I think it even came up in one of these funny little things here of a commissioner saying, oh, well, that's just rude. It's not rude, that's how you run your business. So I would committed that sin, and this person at this unnamed broadcaster, because uh, I don't want to, to personalise it at all, got, got mad, slammed the phone down on me. I can remember it nearly 20 years later. Channel 5 need to be here to defend these things, don't they? <laughs> Channel, Stuart, Channel 5 didn't even exist. It was so that's, five, limit, that's limited it to four. Yeah. Let's, let's keep going and we'll get there. I'm not so saying a word. Talking about the business side, on this slide, and if we move on to the next slide, one of the things that um, producers want to happen is more help with the business affairs side because the commissioning is one thing. Obviously, that can take the time that it takes. Business affairs can then take 
almost as long or sometimes longer. And I think this is quite a horrifying statistic, that 57% of producers have been encouraged to start production without an official green light in the last 12 months. And this has particularly been um, at Channel 5 um, and at Channel 4. But even at the BBC, um, you know, 19%. I, I don't know whether there's a distinction here, Peter, because obviously ITV doesn't cash flow um, programmes. And they don't give them any. No, but, but it's interesting that, that they seem to be the broadcaster that least encourages people to start without an official green light. And, you know, for a small indie, having to bear that burden of cash flowing, of starting to pay your staff, of starting to, yeah. you know, book facilities, book crews, all those things, maybe you can just about bear it on one production, but if it's happening on two or three, that can really damage your business. Um, so, um, I don't know, Jay, do you want to start on this one? Well, I think there's a particular uh, theme that emerges from this slide with us, and, and to be honest, I think this is a transitional period for Channel 4, at least I hope it is, and, and in terms of why are we in this situation, in 2011 when I arrived, we'd lost 200 hours of Big Brother, there'd been very little development at Channel 4 for quite a long time, and to be honest, the cupboard was bare, and so we've been running at a pretty frenetic pace, and I think what this picks up is the urgency between commission and delivery, and I don't think that's a statistic that we'll see in a year's time. I mean, I think our business affairs team are amongst the best in the business, and I'm very proud of the way they work, but we've got to get quicker at closing this gap, but I think it's a particular product of us running very, very fast, and I think I'm now commissioning into 2015 and beyond, and I hope that we'll end up in a situation where we don't see that sort of behaviour. I'm, I'm going to move... Offer a perspective on yeah, this? Yeah, I, I think there's... I mean, obviously, I'm you know, glad to see us coming out, you, you, you know, with that smallest percentage there. But when ITV commissions an independent company, um, the same is true, I'm sure, of Sky, a, a commercial profit-driven company is commissioning another one. And I think that we respect the companies that we commission. And of course, I'm not for a minute saying that BBC and Channel 4 don't, but I think you have to look a long way back into history here, that the BBC, and I can remember from the early days of Talkback when we were trying to get independent productions away, principally with the BBC, and they would write back rather shirty letters saying, it's not our job to invest money that makes profits for your company. Because, of course, the BBC isn't a profit-driven company. It's a publicly We're owned... Public... Not doing that now. No, of course you're not. I'm not suggesting you're doing that now. And again, with Channel 4, and this may reflect one of the reasons why you get more polarised responses, and it's sometimes more difficult responses for Channel 4, I think you have to go right back to the beginning of Channel 4. It's in Channel 4's remit to foster the independent sector. Brilliant. And therefore, as a result, <laughs> the independent sector will have highly developed views about Channel 4 and rather proprietorial views about Channel 4. And so uh, all I'm saying, obviously I'm glad that we seem to have come out best in nearly all the charts you've put up, Lorraine. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I'm glad of that. But I'm, I'm pointing out that around this table, you've got four different organisations with different histories and different relationships with the independent sector. Can I, can I, I just got a quick... Okay. Sorry. Can I mention something on that I'm slide? Not get to the end. Do you mind if I mention something on that slide? Because it's good yeah, to go feed on. back on. Well, I, I mean, I think it's basically one in five, that's probably not good enough at our end. Um, so, and I, I talked to the business affairs team about it when I saw that slide. That their view is that it's happening more on dramas we're co-financing and on some current affairs projects. But I've asked them to do some more work on it because I, I want to see that come down. That's too many. Can I make a very quick point? Yeah. That, you know, often, as a, broad, a flexible broadcaster will say to the business affairs department, if it's taking time, let's slip where the show is in the schedule. And so you'll, you'll not have this thing where the indie says, we've got to deliver on this date because it needs to be on air at this point. If you constantly talk, and in an increasingly complex world, it's hard to coordinate everyone, but you, know, you would slip it in the schedule so there's not this pressure to get into pre-production before the, before the budget's correct. And I'm pleased we came second top in that <laughs> chart. Good, you okay, did well so on some, one of them. So some some one-upmanship <laughs> here. So we're going to move on to the last slide, um, which, in which we asked... Um, how the broadcaster compared um, with itself five years ago. I thought I was going to move on to the last slide. Here it comes. Um, so, obviously, Jay, a bit worrying for you, um, with 61% feeling that Channel 4 has got a lot or a little worse um, since five years ago. Um, Peter, not to make you even smugger, <laughs> Round of applause for ITV. Sixty-seven percent improving. Um, B 
BBC somewhere in the middle. Yeah, and I think that that's a fair reflection of where we are. I think that that's pretty good, but we've got work to do and we can get better, and, and I'll keep pushing for us to get better, and we'll, we'll check again in a year time how we're doing. But I think that's probably better than it was a few years ago, but we've got, we've got some way to go still. So, Jay, what, why do you think uh, things... And we're second as well, can I just say? <laughs> Round of applause for Sky. Honestly, I don't need applause. I don't need affirmation. <laughs> Save it for Peter. So, Jay, look, you're clearly working hard. You've, you know, you've put Stuart in place, you're doing things. Stuart but Cosgrove. Stuart Cosgrove. But there, there is a lot of dissatisfaction, and we can't get away from it. Well, let's, I think we need to put this in context. As I said, this is the fourth one of these in six months. In the PACT survey, we topped the poll. In the broadcast survey, we topped the poll. I think one other thing to note is this is 76 companies from the top 100. And one of the key things that I have been slightly crusading about since I arrived is we had to diversify our supply base. So the top 100 have less of a share of the pie at Channel 4 than they once had. And I think uh, very grateful to my honourable colleague from ITV for uh, raising exactly this issue around Channel 4. We don't have in-house production. I think the indie sector will always rightly have very, very high expectations of Channel 4 and want us to continue to do better. But, I mean, just to give you a snapshot, this is going back five years. One of the reasons I have put so much energy into this and David has put so much energy into this is that the snapshot of where the relationship was at two and a half years ago made slightly bleak reading, to be completely honest with you. There was a strong sense in which it was difficult for people to get in. They couldn't get the meetings. They couldn't get the show away. Now, as I say, we're working with over 400 indies and we've got you know, new suppliers punching through and commissioning shows into peak. So, you know, no but one's going can't. to be happy with a slide like that, obviously. But as I say, in the wider context, this is the year in which Channel 4 topped the broadcast poll and the PAC survey, so it isn't an entirely consistent picture. But in the ITV poll, which I saw because I chaired the ITV's producer forum, Channel 4 also had was the one rated as having got most worse. Okay, but as and I say, you know, we're looking at loads of bits of data, and I'd say it's, it, it's the first time since 1996 that we topped the broadcast poll. To top the PAC survey, I think, is rather extraordinary as well, and that is a survey of all of the independents. We have put a huge amount of focus on getting smaller new suppliers through the door. So am I hugely surprised that people who traditionally got a lot of work from Channel 4 and are getting slightly less think things have got worse? So I'm not hugely surprised, but I think one of the things that it makes me wonder, and I need to think about quite hard, is... The commissioning team is the same size as it was when we were working with a tiny proportion of the indies we're working now. I need to think about, are we, are we confident that we're offering that quality of relationship with this expanded supply base? And I think that's going to be a big, uh, a big thing for us to think about as a team. So just, you know, as we wrap up, reflections from each one of you on what well, James having, probably said, what she's going to do. Are we questions? Yeah. Uh, no questions. I don't think we're taking questions, actually, because I, I don't think we have time, unfortunately. Um, but... Um, one sort of thought from each of you on, okay, if you could do one thing to make things better, what, what would that be? Well, I, I think I'd, I'd say, repeat what I said, which is I think I've got a really good team. I'm very proud of them. I think they're very creative. They do very, very well when it comes to input and production. We're getting better, but we've got work to do, and, and I'm putting in place a few new things, which I hope will do it. I think it's about mutual respect, and I think it's about fulfilling the interest, not just of being good, respectful, doing the right thing, but it's in interest of the BBC if we want to be a great broadcaster. Peter? I think it's really good that we've got this um, subject out in the open. I think it's it, it's a question of kind of um, accountability, and you, you, you know you can you can see it in a wider context of all sorts of people doing jobs in society that haven't been accountable. You know, need to make themselves accountable, and of course, commissioning um, should be made accountable. So I think the main thing is that we we don't just leave it here, but we keep coming back to it. We're certainly going to do our YouGov survey every year. Um, and if, we, if, it, if it tells us things we need to worry about, we'll, we'll, we'll listen and, and keep working on it. I would say just one maybe other thing here to the point that I slightly disagreed with, um, with, with Danny about. Um, I, you know, I'm really glad to see that we're you know, a good deal better than five years ago. And, and I think we've had most of the time a very stable commissioning team. And I think stability is better. Mm. And actually, commissioners get better at their jobs. And if too many of your commissioners are, are doing it for the first time and in their first year, we all started as commission at some point. We all made dreadful mistakes in our first year. Um, you do actually get better. So I'm in favor of stability. So I'll leave and, and that's an interesting point. I mean, Stuart, you've talked about you know, people discussing at Sky how to be a great commissioner. As a producer, you tend to train, you know, you start off as a researcher, you work your way up through being an AP, you learn your craft. As a commissioner, we don't have the same training programs in place. Um, do you think, think we need to be doing that? I think there's, there's funny things about our industry that, that uh, is quite unprofessional in lots of places. 
Um, I think when, <coughs> excuse me, when I went to the BBC, um, even when I was on the board of BBC TV, we'd never explicitly said, these are our values and these are how we work. And lots of companies of similar size do that. At Sky, um, within, I think, a month of you turning up, you meet my boss, um, who's one under the chief exec. Uh, if you're level below me, you meet the chief exec for an hour, I think within two weeks of turning up. Within a week of turning up as a commissioner, I meet the commissioner and say, these are my personal values. You represent me in the industry. This is how I work, and these are my values, and this is, this is what you're going to work to. Um, I think, because I might as well say my summary thing as well, I think what I'd quite like to do is find a way of making sure I get feedback from indies that they can give me that doesn't compromise their relationship with commissioners, because that's a pretty key thing. Um, uh, second thing is, I want to be best. So I'm happy with what we've got, but um, I think we're the best. I was slightly surprised it, it's not reflected in the figures. Um, and third thing is that when we do a survey, I, I want to do a survey, um, an anonymous survey among people who supply to us and separately people who don't, because I suspect there's, um, there's great tips we can have with both those groups. And um, so... And Jay, any final thoughts? Well, I think we've put loads of things in place in the past few months. We're in a couple of other things which I think will help. I mean, we are going to introduce a, a course for new commissioners because I think we've got lots of bespoke bits of training now around negotiating skills, running meetings, giving feedback. But I think we need to bring that together for new commissioners so there is a clear sense of values. The other piece of work we're doing, which I think is interesting, is we've commissioned a survey around, around the way in which file sharing and sending stuff across to broadcasters is changing the dynamic of that relationship. I mean, years ago when we were making shows, you'd see it once, it would go on the telly. But now... There's a constant exchange, constant feedback. What's that doing to the, to the conversation? Does that mean more feedback's been given by email that should be given face to face? And when we come up with the results, I'm very happy to share that with everybody. But you know, we desperately want to get this right. We put a lot of energy into getting it right, and I want us to get better at it. Because the worst scenario is it when you end up with a program that nobody's happy with. Yeah. Okay, well, on that cheerful note. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to very much thank the panel for coming up here, um, for taking it on the chin, um, and uh, for being prepared to be so honest and open with all of you. So uh, many thanks to Danny, Peter, Jay, and Stuart. Thank you.